I would not have her be one of those people on the bridge uh, that didn't make it. That, that just would not be possible. Even were it not for the earthquake, we are especially delighted to have her with us today. Dr. Singer is a leading pioneer in the field of mind and behavioral control and social influence, field of social influence. She has been and is a therapist to hundreds of former cult members. She has been involved in this from the very beginning. Dr. Singer is our resident expert in this area. She's our unofficial guru. And with her quiet dignity in the face of immense pressure from the cults and their sympathizers, she's a continual source of information. Dr. Singer, when I asked for her biography, sent me a 15-page uh, uh, document, and I've had to summarize it because it would have taken all afternoon to read it. That's the kind of stature she has. Dr. Singer received her BA, MA, and PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Denver. She is presently adjunct professor of psychology at the University of California at Berkeley and also uh, teaches at other institutions in the area. And she's engaged in an extensive private practice. I understand that cults are only one of her specialties. Her previous positions include senior investigator, laboratory of clinical psychology, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Washington. She was an associate professor of clinical psychology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York and professor of psychiatry at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and a visiting scholar in residence at UCLA. And as I told you, I'm only summarizing her CV. She has served as consultant to US, the US Military Academy at West Point, United States Air Force Stress and Fatigue Laboratory. We could all use her canceling on that. <laughs> National Institute of Mental Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her many honors include the Research Science Award, Scientist Award, National Institute of Mental Health in 1977, the American Family Therapy Association Award for Distinguished Achievement in Family Therapy Research in 1981, and the Leo J. Ryan Memorial Award in 1981, which is bestowed by the Cult Awareness Network on those who have done the most to educate the public about religious cults. She's a member of 10 professional associations on the editorial board of seven publications and serves on many organizational advisory boards. Her biography lists 93 publications. Dr. Singer. Thank you very much. That long list is all highly correlated with the fact I'm 68 years of age. <laughs> and have been working for many, many years in many very interesting situations and with colleagues, too many to thank for contributing to my career and my teaching and learning. Now, since we're all here today to talk about cults, I'll tell you a little bit of my background that uh, got me interested in it. I've always been very interested in language and how when people talk, how do they influence each other? And I came from a large Irish Catholic family where being able to tell stories at dinner or at any situation was a very important part of my growing up and I became so interested in which people in the family were the more persuasive, who got listened to, what was it about them? And I remember asking my mother as a young child, why did certain people like Uncle Jim? And why was he so important? And she said, oh, he's a great raconteur. I had no idea what it meant or how to spell it. <laughs> but uh, coming from a family where um, you just didn't let on that you didn't understand, I finally was able to get someone to read to me that knew how to spell raconteur and learn what it was about. So that from childhood on, I was very interested in how is language used? And then when eventually I had a PhD and was working in a medical school and some of the psychiatrists there taught me how to do transinduction and hypnosis, I then became aware of how do you use your voice to modulate 
to get people's attention focused to do what I'm doing now. <laughs> and uh, then time goes on, and I was working for the United States Army at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, and uh, the people with whom I were working, and some of them will be on the program tonight, Dr. L.J. West was here, Dr. Robert J. Lifton, Dr. Ed Shine, were all people that I worked with uh, as the Korean War was winding down. And I became very interested in learning how had the Russians and how had the Chinese and then the North Koreans gone, gone about using language and other techniques to influence people. And eventually, as part of that job, I talked with a number of Jesuit and Mary Knoll priests who had been long-term prisoners of the mainland Chinese to learn how had language, influence, et cetera, been used uh, in the situations in the Far East, both on civilian prisoners and upon UN military prisoners. There was then sort of a pause in which most of the brainwashing or thought reform and those of us in the business call it thought reform. That was the proper translation that was introduced into the literature uh, from the Chinese mainland by Bob Lifton, Shine, Dr. West, and others. Uh, those of us that were studying it call it thought reform, which is a correct translation. And Mao Zedong had decided way back in as early as 1927 that he was going to thought reform the Chinese nation, meaning through various means, change them from their old ways of thinking to joining his ways of thinking. So that for a while after the Korean War wound down and some of us kept on doing our research, all that I could study was those few people who were brought back into the US who had been subjected to thought reforms abroad. And while I was so doing that, lo and behold, I began hearing in the late 60s about from parents in the West Coast area about young adults in their families who had in one way or another joined up with the Reverend Moon, the Hare Krishnas, the Church of Scientology, and many of the other large organizations that were just getting going at that time. And eventually, uh, I began to hear about the People's Temple, which was a local California phenomenon. And as you all remember, Charles Manson had his own little uh, very horrible uh, cult. So that by the end of the 60s, I was starting to get very involved in studying what were these new groups that were being called cults? What were they doing? How were they using language and social influence to take people that they met out on the street and in a matter of uh, days to a few weeks have them drop all affiliation with parents, school, past, family, and uh, become solicitors in airports and on street corners and in Berkeley going up and down the areas near the campus uh, soliciting new members. So that uh, I then began talking with both the young adults out on the street and on the university campus as with hundreds of parents to find out what was it that was going on? And I came to see that common, ordinary, what I call the folklore of and the folk art of influence was being packaged up by these various modern day cults now, and being applied to people. Now, you're probably all sitting there saying, well, when's she going to tell us what a cult is? <laughs> OK, we're now to that part. OK, there are about three definitions of cults that you can use. You can take the one from Webster's Third International on a bridge that says cult may convey one or more possible meanings, a system for the cure of disease based on the dogmas, tenets, or principles set forth by its promulgator to the exclusion of scientific experience or demonstration. Two, according to Webster, a cult is great or excessive dedication to some person, idea, or organization. And three, a religion or mystique, ordinarily regarded as spurious or unorthodox. Now, as you see, that covers a wide range of things. I prefer, because my whole interest is in studying the transactions between people. Those of you that are in law enforcement are going to be saying, 
oh, she's talking about how do you run a scam? How do you run a street hustle? How do you con people? That's part of it. I'm talking about <clears throat> how do people go about influencing one another to get a person to do the following. And I like to define cultic relationships. See, the term cult describes the political and power structure of an organization. A cult implies that there is one person at the top. They may have helpers. And the great number of the members are followers at the base of that organization, but that it is not quite a pyramid-shaped thing. It's more like somebody at the top of a T, and everybody is on the upside-down T. The cult leader is at the top. And I prefer to talk about cultic relationships because it describes the interaction and the process that then leads to the appearance of thought reform influence techniques being used by the cult. So cult simply describes the structure. So that I talk about cultic relationships, referring to those relationships in which a person intentionally induces others to become totally or nearly totally dependent on him or her for almost all major life decisions and inculcates in these followers a belief that he or she has some special talent, gift, or knowledge. I'm going to read that a second time because some of you that I can see are trying to get it down. And this is all a definition I'm offering. Cultic relationships are those relationships in which a person intentionally induces others to become totally or nearly totally dependent on him or her for almost all major life decisions and inculcates in these followers a belief that he or she has some special talent, gift, or knowledge. Now, there are some other properties that those of us that study cultic organizations see. And before I get into these others, let me assure you that not all cults are religious in nature. There are food fad cults. There are psychology, psychotherapy cults where someone gets people following them because they tell them they have the one and only way of giving new enlightenment of a psychological kind. There are cultic organizations that are flying saucer type groups so that cults have all different kinds of contents as their philosophy and content. So the term cult refers to the political structure and power structure. They vary in content. Not all cults are religious in nature. First, before we move on, our First Amendment absolutely protects freedom of belief. Our First Amendment does not say that in the pursuit of that, you can go do any old conduct. The law that applies to each of us applies to cult leaders and cult followers as far as conduct goes. So that what people are criticizing are not the belief systems of these groups, it's the behavior of various types of groups, their conduct that gets people all uh, being critical of them. Now, I'm going to read you a few other properties that those of us who study cults want uh, to offer. Remember, cult leaders are self-appointed persons who claim to have a special mission or special knowledge in life. For example, the flying saucer cult leaders claim that people from outer space have commissioned them to lead people to special places to await a spaceship. Cult leaders tend to be charismatic. If you aren't a little bit charismatic, it's awfully hard to get a following. So you have to, in some way, have a touch of something in order to use the folk art 
of social and psychological persuasion to get a following. Also, it helps to be determined. First, be a little charismatic to very determined, and it helps to be domineering. I mean, if you're really going to start a cult. And I want to tell you, some of you in law enforcement may have seen this book that's put out by a press that I won't uh, mention because I don't want them after me next. But there is a book that's put out by one of the underground presses called How to Start and Maintain Your Own Cult by one Duke McCoy. And Duke McCoy has either attended some of my talks or gotten the tapes because there are large quotes in there about how to start and maintain your own cult that have come from lectures that I've given to professional groups. But um, it's not hard to start your own cult if you have a little charisma, you're determined and domineering, and a low conscience level. <laughs> Cults in the modern day sense basically have two purposes, recruiting new members and fundraising. They make statements that they're altruistic and so on, but when either investigative reporters or researchers of various kinds uh, have studied them, they get down to the brass tacks that uh, getting new members and fundraising, then the bottom line reads, with these two things, you're gaining power of various kinds and all money. Now, at the time, cult leaders try to give the idea that what they're promulgating is innovative and exclusive. And it's very hard to start a cult. Somebody's always asking me, is AA, our 12-step programs, cults? No, they're not. People are always asking, well, isn't the Marine Corps a thought-reforming organization? No, they're not. And if we had time, we could go through and talk about why not. Cults are elitist organizations. All of the cults that I've studied of the modern-day ones have the attitude that once you join, you're one of the elite. Like Jim Jones said, that if you would sign postcards, even if you weren't a full-fledged member of the People's Temple, that you could be part of the elite because that would save and take over the world after a particular uh, A-bomb came because he was going to send out postcards as soon as he knew when the end was coming and he would let the people know via postcard, as well as those that were present at the People's Temple know when the end was coming. Uh, and these people were to be the exclusive and the elitists that saved the world. And those of you that have had contact with people in any of the uh, large cultic organizations realize that they sell a philosophy of elitism. All of the rest of us that are on the outside are lesser beings and can be tricked or lied to because we are lesser beings. And think how different this is than the general major philosophy that's held in a democratic society such as ours. The next thing, cult leaders focus the veneration of members upon themselves, not to higher order goals, not to God, not to abstract principles, but the follower's veneration is directed to uh, the leader himself or herself. And for the women in the audience, there aren't a whole lot of women cult leaders. There are many, many lieutenants to cult leaders who are females, but um, so far it appears to be a much more male-dominated uh, enterprise. Most cults have a double set of ethics. Members are, ur are urged to be open and honest within the group but and to confess all to the leaders. But on the other hand, they are encouraged to deceive and manipulate outsiders or non-members, whereas the established religions teach members to be honest and truthful to all and to abide by one set of ethics. And as I've already brought out, cults are authoritarian in their power structure, they tend to be totalitarian and totalistic in the control of the behavior of their members. I have an outline, and 
The first thing was, what is a cult? The second thing, history of cults. Okay, to briefly give you a bit of history uh, of cults, many people wonder why in the past perhaps 15 years to 20 years, it's more like a little over 20 years, we've been seeing the growth of cults here in the U.S. People wonder why we're seeing this current proliferation of cults. Throughout history, when there have been breakdowns in the structure and rules of societies, cults have arisen. At those times, self-appointed messiahs, determined gurus, and various Pied Pipers have induced people to follow them, claiming they have a simple solution for the complex problems of life and that their way is the only way. In the United States of the late 1960s, we had the kind of setting out of which cults have arisen in the past. Historical trends would have predicted, as some persons did, that as the United States went through the social and political changes of the 60s, the drug culture, the protest marches, the anti-war demonstrations, the war itself, civil disobedience, student rebellions, the sexual revolution, and breakdowns in family life that the social climate was right for cult leaders to appear, and they did. All um, past cults appealed to the marginal groups in the society of their period. In the 60s, young people were the marginal group. The first cults that emerged tended to be Eastern philosophy in nature, and they primarily appealed uh, to young adults. As time has gone on, we have seen that cults repeat, recruit people of all different ages. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about now is what is it that those of us that are in the mental health and behavioral sciences field are interested in about cults. We are not studying, some are, but most of us in psychology and psychiatry are not interested very much at all in the content of the belief systems. What we're interested in is the packaging of these influence techniques into what we're coming to call coordinated programs of coercive influence and behavior control. What we began to see as the cults started evolving in the late 60s, and since they were starting up here in the US, and as I said, cults have down through history started when there have been breakdowns in the structure of society. At the fall of Rome, there was a, after the fall of Rome, there was a proliferation of cults. Uh, after the French Revolution, when the Industrial Revolution came in England and many people moved into industrial centers from farm areas and didn't know how to deal with and react to the power structure and how to find their place in it. After the um, discovery of gold in the West, and people moved from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States, there was then a proliferation of cults. Right after the Civil War, again, a springing up of many cults. Those of you that have studied the trend of things in Japan, right at the end of World War II was when very many cults sprang up in Japan. When there's a breakdown in the structure of society, the ever-present people who would like to get their own following, they're always present in all societies down through time. But when there are a lot of people looking for answers of how to relate to your family, how to relate to the power structure of your society, how to reconstitute a power structure of a society if it's broken down, the ever-present self-appointed people who want a following are present. And proclaim that they have some secret knowledge or a special way. Well, when we saw the 60s uh, drawing to a close and all of the civil unrest and so on here in the US, what became interesting then 
was that the cults were taking over right at a time when pop psychology had hit its peak. And those of you that lived in California particularly remember people were going to experiences. And they said that in quotes. You could hear the quotes around they were going to an experience. This experience that they would go to would be some kind of a group situation in which many of the techniques that psychologists and psychiatrists had been using in group therapy selectively, responsibly, and with very small groups of people were available from the encounter group movement and from the sensitivity training programs that had the techniques of which had reached the pop psychology level here in the US. So when the cult started, some of the groups like Rajneesh, he said in some of his literature that he was actually offering 60 different variants of pop psychology. So that when one went to Rajneesh, you not only got the philosophy content, but a real smorgasbord of psychological techniques applied to you. Well, some of the other larger cultic organizations by the late 60s had become aware of all of the literature on thought reform, some of the hierarchy that started some of the more successful uh, cultic thought reform programs were individuals who had been in social psychology programs at some of the major universities here in the United States. And one of the largest uh, of the international cults had as its head a former uh, head of the intelligence agency of a Far Eastern country. As you notice, I'm going low on naming those people because most of you know who they are, and um, they pester me enough, and I don't mention their names. I have no idea what it would be like if I really mentioned their names. I've been picketed in 15 different cities where I wasn't talking about any of these cults. I was giving professional lectures, like one time, to a dental association on how to do hypnosis on little groups of kitties, or little groups, you know, six to eight client patients that Dennis had, how to teach group trance induction techniques. The hospital where the dentists were having their meeting, security man came in and said, ma'am, there are some people in Nazi uniforms picketing in the ambulance drive. Would you come tell us if you know who they are? <laughs> So I, you know, I said, they have on Nazi uniforms. And I said, yeah, if you count them, there's going to be 15 of them, because apparently these two organizations only bought 15 <laughs> Nazi uniforms. <laughs> and they ship them around the country. And there I was. I said to him, you know, do whatever you do. I'm not talking about them. I'm giving a lecture on how do you do hypnosis for a small group of people, group technique, so that uh, if you wonder why I don't mention some of the large litigious and very wealthy groups by name and more explicitly, eh, so you can read it in the newspaper. <laughs> um, what I'd um, like to do is tell you that thought reform programs or coordinated programs of coercive influence and behavior control or coercive persuasion are technical terms that are ways people have labeled the packaging of just common, ordinary influence techniques into coordinated programs of various kinds. Now, if you were going to start your cult, what are the conditions to run a thought reform program? Now, Dr. Lifton, who will be talking on a couple of occasions here, and Dr. West, who is here, and I don't know if Dr. Orne, I don't think he's going to be able to get here, along with uh, Dr. Ed Shine and I and a few others, we've been the ones most interested for approximately 37 years studying thought reform programs across time. Shine talks about stages in a thought reform or coercive program. Lifton talks about the themes that are present in thought reform programs. 
I have spelled out from my work and from some work I've done with Dr. Richard Offshe that there are kind of six conditions that if you have them present, you run a good chance of being able to conduct a thought reform program. The first thing you need to do is get control of the person's time. You don't have to have them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But try to get control over their time. Two, create a sense of powerlessness in them. So that when they're at your group, they hear people talking in certain ways and they don't know what the words mean. But most of the people present seem to. So that the new persons into the group want to become like the rest of the group. Those of us that are social creatures really want to have group connections. We want to get some warmth and exception, acceptance and affection from other human beings. So that like if you're a, at a meeting like this, you hear new terms and you ask what they are because you want to be able to go home and read and understand more and follow what's going on. So that if you're going to do the standard conditions. First, get control over the person's time. Two, create a sense of powerlessness in the person. Then by manipulating rewards, punishments, and experiences, you start inhibiting and suppressing the old social behavior that the person brought with them. And you start by manipulating rewards, punishments, and experiences, you start eliciting the new behavior that you want the people to show. You have to do it in a closed system of logic where there are no complaints from the underlings. It's all from the top down. And the final critical thing is people must be unaware that they're being moved through a program whose goal it is to make them deployable agents of management. That means, in the end, you'll buy courses, you'll sign up for the duration with the cult leader. You don't know it at the beginning. There has to be this special uninformed state. People are always saying to me, well, isn't that how it is when you go off to be a Jesuit? Isn't that how it is when you go off to join the Marine Corps? Well, the answer is no. You know when you go to the Marine Corps, you may not know how muddy it's going to be and you know exactly what drill sergeants are going to be like and so on. And when you join the Jesuits, you don't know how hard it may be in the end to wrestle with your own human conscience and your own human mind. But you know ahead of time and they have a long period. And I swear, somebody should make me an honorary Jesuit or an honorary Marine Corps person because every time I testify in court, I have to defend these organizations as not being mind control and thought reform organizations. And I have a great long list of how they differ and especially I have to have a great long list for the Marine Corps because there are always a bunch of people present that have not been in the military and think that it's a horrible place that brainwashes people. No, it's an indoctrination program for the military and you know what it is when you're going. They don't, you know, the recruiting sergeant doesn't have on a dress and pretend it. Uh, he's a sister of mercy. Uh, <laughs> You know what you're joining and that it's rough and so on. So that those six conditions, if some of you here in, a, in an audience this size, some of you are already with a cult and you're here to spy, you know, to find out is the old girl saying anything new this time? <laughs> the answer is no, because there are a lot of people here who've heard me talk before and they've heard most of what I'm saying and they can do uh, this themselves because this is general knowledge in the field, what I'm saying. But those six conditions that I've gone through, if you get those present, and you read Lifton's book, and you read Shine's book, and you read the literature on thought reform, 
and you package up all the techniques that you can. There's a book called Influence by Cialdini, C-I-A-L, D-I-N-I, who's a wonderful sociologist down at Tempe, Arizona. And he's packaged up in that book all the influence techniques that used car salesmen, con artists, hustlers, manipulators use. So if you read a few books, you can start your own cult and start doing your own thought uh, reform program. But as I said, it depends. You have to have no conscience, and you have to not care that you're using the lives, the minds, the altruism, and goodwill of other people for your own gain if you start a cult. Now, on that cheery point, I would like to open up the meeting for questions. What comes to mind anything that you would like to ask? Just get up and ask. Yes? It won there, too. They get to try it. Yes, that's a very interesting case. And the comment is, since it has not been tried, all of the situation is two former members of the Unification Church, Mr. Malko and Ms. Leal, uh, started a suit against the Unification Church. And the uh, courts have upheld that testimony can be provided in the area of those influence techniques that are called coercive persuasion, brainwashing, or thought reform. Because the big push was to see, and this, there's still pressure on, to attempt to discourage people who are scholars in the area of thought reform uh, to not get involved in legal cases because you get so much flack for doing it. And uh, I'm one of the ones that uh, was originally and still will be when that case is tried, one of the people appearing to describe what is thought reform, what is it like now, and um, that's what the Malko and Wheel case is. It's been in process in the court a number of years and clear to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the issue has been taken, and yes, there will be people there saying, as I say, thought reform exists. The experts that work for the uh, Unification Church are going to be there saying, thought reform doesn't work without gun at the head in a prison setting, and they are simply wrong because they distort many, many things and all. Uh, take things out of context and so on. But that's what the gentleman was asking about, Malco and Leal, and it will in all likelihood be tried in California eventually. Next. Yes, I'm quite sure from interviewing many, many people that have been close to a number of cult leaders at the start of the cults and so on, some of the cult leaders really believed that they had a good idea at the start. And then when they came to see how easy it was to get followers, and they had set up an organization where no negativity and no criticism was permitted, Pretty soon it's like that old phrase that says, power corrupts and total power totally corrupts. Some of them that started with a pretty good notion have then literally, between themselves and their followers, gotten into a really corrupting interaction. For those of you that want to read a good book from the perspective of a couple of good investigative reporters, the book is called Raven, R-A-V-E-N, it's about Jim Jones, and it's by Reiterman, R-E-I-T-E-R-M-A-N, and Jacobs. And in Raven, these two investigative reporters from the uh, San Francisco newspapers show how Jones always had been a sort of psychopathic-like 
person way back. He shot two of his playmates in the uh, legs and heels when they wanted to go home, and he wanted them to stay longer. So he did not have a nice, neat childhood. But uh, this book, Raven, describes to you from these two investigative reporter studies how Jones fed off the followers, the followers fed off of him, and their thesis is that without collaboration by the followers, Jones would not have gotten what he got going, and you can extrapolate that to other programs. Was there anything else, Dr. Morse, in your question that I forgot to answer? Thank you. There's a gentleman up here. Uh, Talk into the microphone because the folks in the back may not hear you well. The model that you've been presenting is, is one of uh, the cult leader and uh, the followers as a uh, base, both an economic and political base, uh, which uh, seems to me to be accurate as far as it goes. Uh, there have also though, been rumors uh, uh, for many, many years about uh, uh, an economic and political base for cults upward to the uh, um, the, uh, the covert organizations of uh, various nations, uh, to the uh, international drug trade, to uh, money laundering uh, uh, businesses, which it seems to me would be an important, if, if true, would be an important part of understanding where the cult of power comes from. Uh, I've always found it uh, hard to pin down the accuracy of those uh, statements. I wanted to say something about them. I've had the same situation that it's hard to pin down. And I'm sure there are still investigative reporters and others trying to pin down what the upward connection, if any, that can be established is. And uh, there's this book called Inside the League that some of you might want to read. And um, if Michael Lisman is here, I think he can remember who wrote it. Sir. No, he's not here. He and I both read the book about the same time. Anderson. Anderson, thank you very much. Inside the League by Anderson. And uh, as you know, some of the large organizations, there's another book for those of you in law enforcement that want to see the connection between some of the uh, drug and gun and murders uh, inside the Hare Krishna organization. That's in a book called uh, Monkey on a Stick by um, Lindsay Grusen, G-R-U-S-O-N, and John Hubner, H-U-B-N-E-R. Again, investigative reporters. The first one's from the New York Times, the second one is from the San Jose Mercury. And uh, they have gone through uh, and pinned down the various drug, gun, and murders associated with that group and have documented them through court and other records. But uh, at one of these meetings, I'm sure some year there will be people studying just at that level and will bring us some either yes and confirming it or no and disconfirming in certain things. But it's a very good issue. Thank you. first one, the discrepancy between the follower's standard of living and that of the uh, uh, cult leader. Remember, these programs change an individual a step at a time. And the leaders have ways of rationalizing. And usually the way they rationalize that they live in such style and glory is because they've gotten the followers to believe that the outside world and their parents and their old life 
is a corrupt and venal and evil group. They say that so-and-so, the leader, has to deal with these bad and evil people in the outside world who only respect money and jewels and silk clothing, so that a step at a time the people have become made dependent on the leader, they've come to accept a step at a time his or her philosophy, and then a step at a time they come to literally push their old conscience and because they're so dependent on the organization and they're taught that negativity is wrong. You can't run a cult and let people complain to management. It just is very difficult. <laughs> so that that's how it happens. They are a step at a time, changed a step at a time, given the ideal, and they are persuaded that outsiders are these venal people that just like jewelry and fancy things and that the cult leader, in order to deal with those people, has to look like a powerful and successful person. Now, the second question was what? Just the key phrase. The answer is some are and some aren't, because I've interviewed a large number of people who have left some of the major cults as well as small cults. Some of them were totally aware that it was a corrupt leader. They knew that he was having sexual hanky-panky with the teenage children of followers. They knew a lot of the underside and the shady side of the cult leader, but at that point, usually they were so dependent that they stayed, even though they knew it. Some of them, once they discovered it and their old conscience flashed back to the center of their thinking, they left. And some of you that saw some of the letters that some of the swamis wrote after they left Muktananda when they learned of some of Muktananda's behavior, those people struggled with their own conscience and said they couldn't stay. So that the people at the top are really a mixed bag. It's just like some of the people we read about that have hit the uh, headlines recently uh, with uh, like uh, Mr. Jimmy Baker, Mr. Bosky, various people that get on the top line of the New York Times, they have people near them that are aware they have people near them that are not aware. It's like any great big business enterprise. Some are going to know and some aren't. Sir. Uh, I have just finished reading a book called Cults by a man, I don't remember his name. Yeah, yes, from New York uh, University. He's in charge of the substance abuse program there. And he has a different concept of cults. And he prefers to use. Come on, Mike. Mark Gallanter's book on cults, yeah. And he calls it, he prefers not to use the word cult, even though that is the title of his book, he calls it a charismatic group. Mm -hmm. And he has certain characteristics, many of which I think you have cited here. Um, and he says one of them is the carefully monitored behavior of the people, the use of their time and their activities, and so on. But he uses a more general definition, saying that not all of them are cults, and he uses Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, as an example of a cult, a charismatic group. I would like to refer this gentleman to a book review that may be here that I did of Mark Gallanter's book. And one of the main criticisms of Gallanter's book, thank you for the question. One of the main criticisms of Gallanter's book is that he takes this term charismatic group and he equates, if you would believe, Alcoholics Anonymous, cults, and terrorist organizations. And see, that gets one into a real logical bind. And those of you that are here that are members of AA know that there is almost a zero correlation between membership and participation in AA 
and the fact that Bill W., who started AA, is not adored, he is not followed. It's just a total different thing. And when you try to explain uh, modern day cults, terrorist organizations, and AA in one group, and I don't know if the cult awareness people have my book review, but if you're interested, it would be very helpful. Because I go through and try to show the logical pitfalls that Dr. Gallanter got into in trying to take that look. And the thing is, you need to look at the last chapter in that book where it has this appended quality to it, as if editors and publishers call to his attention that there is another side, that there are people saying uh, that there are some criticisms made of terrorist organizations and that there are criticisms made of cults. And the other thing that's so interesting, his book does not start studying the cult phenomenon until after people are already in. And in my book review, I gave an analogy of the following kind. Suppose an encyclopedia salesman knocks at the door. The lady in the apartment lets him in. He persuades her to buy the encyclopedia and then leaves. What Gallanter does is he starts studying affiliation in the uh, Moon Organization and Unification Church only after the recruiters have met the people and they have been processed through various steps on our into the group. So that it would be very hard to talk about how it was the lady bought the encyclopedia that she probably had no intention of buying in the first place prior to the salesman coming in and the people who had no idea and they weren't really looking for Brand X cult at the time they were met on the street. So that uh, Gallanter and I see things quite differently because of where he cuts in to try to explain them. And if you actually read his book with a fine tooth comb, you're going to come to see he's totally aware of some of the deceptions that are involved and so on, but he only talks about them late in the back of the book. So that I advise you, because it's an open and free world, read things that cult apologists write, read things that those of us that study them in a less um, dedicated but much more open-minded way. We are not particularly for or against them. We try to study them as we see them. Sometimes people get lost because of the relationship that they form with groups as they're studying them. Next. Yes, ma'am. Uh, There's a whole bunch of, those are called the hooks. Those of you that are in sales, you have to have a hook to get a person to look at the merchandise. Sometimes the hook is taking yoga lessons, sometimes it's a free meditation lesson, sometimes a free massage lesson, um, health food lectures, any kind of an introductory thing, and then the group tries to then recruit out of those who do show an interest so that uh, uh, just doing yoga is yoga. But if that is a cover for you being recruited into the next stage, then it's called a hook in the sales uh, world. I have a note from our beloved leader, whom we all obey without negativity. There's only time for one more question before we go to our other programs. Lady back there got her hand up first. Yes, ma'am. What kinds of cults are being found within the high school population? All kinds. Most of the big international ones recruit at that level. 
Uh, some of you uh, know that there are a number of people dabbling in Satanism and the occult and so on. Uh, so that almost everybody is looking for the high school people because that's the potential pool where the next generation of cults are going to get their followers because most universities have uh, Marsha Rudin and a whole bunch of people presenting information to entering college, fresh, uh, college freshmen. Hardly anybody is helping at the high school level. Sandy Andron, some of the people here, are into providing information at the high school levels. In Berkeley, California, a few years ago, one of the large international cults was actually recruiting in one of the junior high schools in Berkeley by being out on the grounds at noontime and after school and offering the kids rides. I just got another letter. A free copy of Singer's Review of Gallanter's book is, in, is available just by contacting the CAN National Office. It's one word. Contacting? Contacting. A free copy of Singer's Review of Gallanter's book is available just by contacting the Cult Awareness Network National Office. Thank you for a very courteous and cheery morning. Thank you.